This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. I was born, right? <laughs> <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Paul Hutchinson. Paul, how are we? I am so good. Listen, a man on a mission from billionaire entrepreneur to then going undercover for 10 years, exposing, I believe, the world's darkest thing, which is child trafficking, human trafficking. Where do we start with this? This is, um, I spoke about this kind of stuff three, four years ago. People call you a conspiracy theorist, theorist you're crazy. But this thing goes deep. And you exposing it with um, the new film that you released was was mad, but again, by exposing that sort of stuff comes a lot of hate with that sort of stuff because it's the elite. So listen, it's from the bottom to the top, I believe human trafficking has become the most exclusive and the most money maker on the planet. It's took over drugs in my own opinion um, because kids aren't just getting prost- used as prostitutes, they're also... Um, organ harvesting and so much mad stuff but first and foremost how are you i am i am really good and i'm i'm grateful to have the opportunity to share on your on your platform with your good audience because our goal was to create a movement to to help people see really really what's going on and i've been there i have i have led or played a key part in over 70 undercover rescue missions in 15 countries. And so I know for a fact that these things are not conspiracy. I have seen them with my own eyes. Yeah, and you executive producer of uh-huh. The Sound of Freedom? Of The Sound of Freedom, yes. Did you realize how big that was going to be? Because I know it lay in the, kind of in the back for five years when nobody would touch it, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We, you know, I, <clears throat> the reason I, I'm the primary, the first investor in The Sound of Freedom and the executive producer, and the reason I put even a penny in was not not so that I can make millions of dollars coming back as a as a savvy investor in films. You know, you don't invest in films to make money. You 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 do it to to make an impact in some way. And I knew, I knew that the only way to really make a difference is to get millions of people to see what I had seen firsthand. And so, and you can't take them undercover. I mean, that, everybody gets shot, you know, that would be dangerous. But, but if we could create a film that would get in front of millions of people, that would be beautiful. But you're right, five years ago, we had finished the film completely and, and had a really, really hard time taking it out to the world. It was it was so difficult. Every single distributor was turning us down right and left. Disney had frozen the distribution rights because they bought out the 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 guys at at, um, at Fox International, and they it was it was a lot of back and forth. And I thought, is the only person who thinks this is a good film myself, and the, the guys who who made it, does nobody think this is good? And because everybody was just turning us down, we realized later it's because it went against their narrative. It went against what they're trying to force feed you and your family with the information that they're putting yeah. out instead. 
Before we get into all the dark stuff, Paul, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, how it all began. For sure. For sure. Well, I, <clears throat> I uh, you know, way back, um, I don't know how much detail, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few key tidbits because I think this is important. Um, as a child, I remember I was eight years old and I had some neighbor kids, Chris and Jason. They were, they were, they were ruthless bullies to me. And, and I remember being out and talking to them at one point and, and, um, and they were being really mean. And I went back home and I said to my mom, I said, mom, I, I decide what I want to do when I grow up. She goes, what's that? I said, I want to be a brain surgeon. She's like, why a brain surgeon? And I said, because people, they, they need to change how they think, right? That's, that was, and I was serious. I actually started to study. I was eight years old trying to figure, then I decided to change it to instead of being a brain surgeon, I decided I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And, and I think intuitively I realized that in order to fix those things, like bullying and everything else, you need to start. You need to start here with the heart. And I didn't want to just be, you know, a doctor. I want to be a surgeon, not just a regular surgeon, a heart surgeon, not a regular heart surgeon, but a pediatric cardiologist, one that operated on children. And I, I studied for years. I did all my pre-med stuff. I was, um, yeah, did some of it even in high school. And then two months away from taking the MCAT, I got a major, major car accident and I severed the tendons in my hand. And they didn't know if I'd have the dexterity to be a surgeon, and they said, well, you can, you can be a regular doctor. I said, I don't want to be a regular anything. I said, if I'm going to be a garbage man, I'm going to own the dump, right? That's just how I think. I'm, a, I'm going all the way. I've got one life. I've got to, I've got to play big. And, and so I changed my major to business, finance. Um, I always felt like I would be involved in a war of some, some sort, but I didn't, I didn't, sign up as a, as in the military at all, but I trained, I trained on, on hand to hand combat. And I mean, I could go on for hours on a lot of the different training and little did I know that the war that I'd be fighting would be against the darkest part of humanity, which would be child trafficking. And we can go into depth about how I got involved in that as well. How was your family? How was your family life? Mom, dad? There, it was, I, I was really fortunate to be in a, in a good, healthy home. I was, we were in a, in a, a, a good religious environment where I was taught honesty and integrity and love. I had four younger sisters. I, I was their protector, you know, this big brother. Um, little did I know that right in our own neighborhood and in our own families, there were, there were some really horrible things going on in terms of of child abuse and things like that, that would affect me and my family long-term. Um, statistically, in the United States, one out of every four women have admitted that they were a, a victim of sexual violence as a child, most of them in their own home. And that's just the ones that say something about it. We found in our healing ceremonies that we help put on that, that the number is at least half, if not more, of, of the women that come in that, that have dealt with that kind of trauma as children. For men, it's a little bit less. There's one in every five, about 20% of men admit that they uh, were a victim of sexual violence at some time in their life. Most men never admit it. They, they hold on to that pain their whole life. And it shows up in low self-esteem or anger or, or not feeling good enough, anxiety, depression. Some, some cases it comes out as, as what I call trauma transfer in, in spreading that trauma on to somebody else in the form of physical abuse or verbal abuse or even sexual abuse of a child. So you've seen abuse as a kid as well? Did you see a lot of dark stuff with around you and your family? I, I, um, in high school, I was brought in to be the president of something called the peer leadership team. And what it was is, is if a, if a, if an adolescent, if a teenager a student had a problems at home that they didn't feel comfortable going in and talking to their their uh, a teacher or somebody else. They could talk to a peer counselor, somebody their own age. And so we went through some training on how to be a peer counselor, how to talk to them about their problems and things like that. And, and it was amazing to me how many of those kids had dealt with that kind of abuse. The, 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 there's a huge percentage of the kids that were dealing with, 
with drug abuse issues and other things like that, that those things started with, with problems when they were children in their own homes. What do you think that is with you saying one in four, maybe over half of people being abused at some point in their life like, as a human? What is What do you think it is that makes people want to do destruction and cause harm and, and do devil's work, basically? It's, what, what is that? Is the mindset? Because not surely, not every, every I'd imagine, every, I believe every person born is good. Yeah. They're a bundle of yeah. love, light, and whatever it is. So something must trigger those paths to then go and do the destruction, whether it's porn or alcohol or maybe, I know a lot of people who was abused themselves turned into be abusers, but for the world to be so grim and so dark, because I've interviewed men, and as you'll know, men don't speak as frequently or as openly as women. So yeah. there were a lot of, the, the st stats were probably even higher in men. Because um, I've interviewed men who took 20, 30 years to open up about being abused. But what do you think it is that the mind of human beings want to do that to innocent kids? Here's what I found. <clears throat> hurt people hurt other people, right? It's coming from a place of pain. And now people ask me all the time. They, they say, Paul, how can you go face to face with somebody selling you a child and I have them see the anger and the hatred in your eyes. And, and my answer surprised them and it, and, it, and it makes some people mad. It's this, I don't, I don't hate them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not a sympathizer. I put my life in danger to ensure they never, ever, ever hurt another child. But what I wish more than anything is that I could go back five or 10 years I had a time machine, right? I could go back 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whenever it was before they ever crossed that line, before they ever touched a child, before they ever hurt another human being in that way. And if I could go back at that point and, and, and figure out what was going on in their life, what was happening? What kind of pain were they holding on to from their own childhood? What kind of pain and loneliness did, were, they, were, were, were they just piling on themselves that they could just, if I could help them release that, somehow help them identify the fact that what happened to them, even what they did as a child does not define them today. And by releasing it there, I believe we would save millions of children. Now we don't have a time machine, right? We can't go back and do that. But what we do have is literally hundreds of millions, hundreds, if not billions of people on this earth who are holding on to pain, holding on to trauma, holding on to things that don't belong to them. And men, men will say, well, you know, in, in their mind, they're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that, that, you know, my, my uncle did that to me when I was eight. And, you know, it'll, it'll make me less of a man if I, if I talk about that. No, it won't. You were eight, right? You were a child. There was, there was a man who was holding on to a lot of his own pain and anger that was passing that on to that child. And so by just simply talking about it, talking about it makes a huge impact for here, here's the numbers. Here's the numbers for every three people who were abused, sexually abused as a child for every three people, two thirds of them, God bless them. They grow up to be protectors, right? They're, they're, that pain makes it so that they're going to make sure that children never get hurt in that way. However, one out of three, if gone unresolved, if they don't get the help that they need, if they don't get the love and the healing that they need, one out of every three will become contact offenders themselves. That's a huge number. And that one out of every three isn't just going to affect one child. Many times it's 10, 20, 30, upwards of 100 plus children that they're going to, to hurt in some way because of, of their poor choices. And so, so what, what we need to do is we need to figure out ways to, yes, we need, to, once somebody's crossed that line, don't get me wrong, if they've crossed that line, if they've, if they've raped a child, they're wasting my oxygen, right? They need to be behind bars. They need to be in a place where they can't touch that, that innocence. They can't hurt that innocence again. But from a compassionate standpoint, we as humanity 
need to love each other, help each other heal, take these teenagers, take these young adults, and get them to the point where they can feel comfortable talking about their pain, release that pain, so that they never transfer that pain onto somebody else. So your life then, you become entrepreneur, very successful. Was life not going good then? <laughs> was like, oh, were you feeling good? Were you feeling powerful? Were you feeling important? Like, when you're going through those steps as an entrepreneur, how, how were you feeling going was, through that journey? I was, I was, I was what everybody wishes they could be, right? I was, I was there. I was seriously. I had a basketball court in my basement, right? I, I had all the members of the NBA team in my area were there playing ball in my basement and had parties with beautiful women at my house and a pool and waterfalls on both sides of my house. And, and I had, I had, I had 450 people at my house for a party one night, right? 450 inside my house. This was like, I was living the life. I had, at one point I had to register 57 vehicles with, with a license. I'm like, I have 57? Where the hell are all my cars, right? I'm trying to, this is the kind of life I had at one point. And the average person's like, well, that's a nice lifestyle. No, it's, it's yes, it was. It, now there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with working hard and, and creating a beautiful lifestyle. But sometimes it's super empty, right? And, and, and unless you are creating value in the lives of others, all the value you create for your own life can be super empty. And, and if we go back, back when I was in my early 20s, I had a mentor and he said, Paul, he said, make a decision today that you're going to, he said, the average person donates 2% of their money to charity to making a difference in the lives of others. 2% is all. He said, and what's crazy is millionaires donate less percentage-wise average than people who were, who were broke. He said, decide today that you're going to not do 2%, not even 5%, not even 10%, but upwards of 15 to 20% of your money to charity, to making a difference in the lives of others. And I said, I said, Matt, can I? This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Can I wait until I'm rich? To, to, to start giving my money away? Why do I have to start now? He goes, no, you start now so you can be rich, right? He said, because I, I thought, I thought, okay, I'm going to be successful so that I can be charitable. He said, no, be charitable so you can be successful. And it was a new paradigm. He said, you can call it karma. You can call it the universe. You can call it God, call it whatever you want to. He said, there's a, there's a greater power very interested in us doing good. And if you choose to do good, there's this universal law of exchange where you're doing good, where something's going to come back good for you. Now, you can choose to have the thing that comes back as your inflated ego. Look at that good stuff that I did. Boom, I got inflated ego. The, the, the universe responded. They gave you equal exchange back. Or you can do it without trying to inflate your ego, not trying to tell everybody how good you did, and some other good things are going to come back. And for me... It was, it was in the form of, of financial gain. I would just give, 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 and I wasn't like telling everybody about it. But what would happen is I would work, I would work really hard in my business goals because I, I love working hard. And I'd have de decent results because I worked my ass off. And then if I had tried to have a powerful, positive impact in the lives of others, I would have huge results in my business. And those results very seldom were they from my own work. They were usually, you know, gifts from God, things that would come just amazing, just miracles that would happen to grow. And I, I, I think that God does that in my life because he knows that Paul Hutchinson has a propensity to have an ego. So he wants me to know that I had nothing to do with the growth of a multi-billion dollar company. You know, it just grew and grew and grew. Amazing miracles. Now, my, my mentor also said to me, he said, Paul, not only, and I'm like, I'm whining, right? I'm like, 
can I just wait until I'm rich to give away my money? He's like, no, start now when you're broke, when you're given, when you're earning $2,000 a month, you know, give away 20% of that and miracles will happen. He said, and give away 20% of your time. I'm like, what? He said, if you're, if you're, if you're working 40 hours a week, look at donating about eight hours a week worth of time to charity as well. I'm like, oh, that's, that's, that's worse than giving away my money, right? I, and how, how am I going to focus on my business? But by doing that, it made all the difference. How, did, how does somebody become a partner, let alone a founder, of a multi-multi-billion dollar investment fund? Where you're, you're not a University of Utah dropout, right? That's who I am, right? I'm a University of Utah dropout. The statistical probability of me being where I am is zero. The only way I can understand it is that I made that decision in my early 20s that I was going to generously donate until it hurt and beautiful things came back in. So that kind of trained me on the charity thing. But everything, everything changed 10 years ago when I got a call from the attorney general that started talking about child trafficking. So your life then creating a multi multi billion dollar company parties lavish lifestyle that's the people see that lifestyle and that's the lifestyle they, they try and strive towards but you know yourself it's bullshit it's fake it's an illusion it doesn't even exist because when the shit hits the fan no one's ever really there anyway but you're oblivious to it <clears throat> did you know how dark sex the child trafficking was or was it that phone call 10 years ago i didn't even know it existed the attorney general called me, the attorney general in Utah. He, he called me and he said, Paul, he said, I know, I know you've donated lots of money and lots of time to a lot of child-related charities. I was on the uh, a board of directors for an organization called Make-A-Wish, Make-A-Wish in, in our area, which, you know, it grants uh, beautiful uh, wish opportunities to children who have life-threatening illnesses, right? You know, if a, if a little girl is, is, is struggling with cancer and her wish is to you know, see the Disney princess, you know, we would pay to have her go to Disneyland. Or a little boy, he's always wanted to drive in a Lamborghini. I would find a friend that would have that, et cetera, right? So I, 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 I focused my charity work with children, but I had no idea that this even existed. And so he said, I need to talk to you about something that's really dark. He said, this is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. I said, really, what's that? He said, it's human trafficking. I'm like, like selling people? Like, I, I thought that disappeared back, you know, the, in the 1700s, 1800s, if that, anywhere. I mean, that, that doesn't exist. He says, no, it gets worse. He said, he said it's certain, this was 10 years ago. He said, it's, it's now the second most profitable, and it'll soon become the most profitable. He says, it surpassed the illegal arms trade. It's soon going to surpass the drug trade, because you can sell a bag of cocaine once. You can sell a child 5, 10, 15, 20 times a day for 10 or 20 years. And I'm like, sell a child? What would you sell a child for? And he started talking about how sick people, broken people will, will go to some of these third world countries and, and, and engage in these activities with children, sex with children. I'm like, what? And so he introduced me to a Homeland Security agent who would, had been working on a case in Colombia, in Latin America. And um, he told me about these 20 children that he had found in Cartagena that were being sold for sex. And he needed some money to help put that together. I introduced him to some people. I helped to fund some things. And then he called me a few weeks later. Now, let me set the stage on this. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I've got I've got a $50,000 watch on. I've got $2,000 cufflinks on. I've got a, a custom suit that costs more than my first car, right? <laughs> right? I'm low. And, I'm, and I, I'm at this conference and I'm, I'm meeting with third, fourth generation billionaire families, talking to them about my investment strategy, right? This is, I'm in this opulent, opulent hotel and I get this phone call from the attorney general, I mean, from the, the Homeland Security agent. And he said, Paul, he said, I'm in Cartagena, Colombia. There's not just 20 children here. There's more than 50 and probably more than 100 children tied to these same trafficking rings 
in different areas of the, the country. He said, we, we can rescue all 100 children on the same day at the same time. And it, I need your help if you're willing. I said, well, how much do you need? You know, I've got my big ego on at the time. How much do you need? I'll write you a check. You know, you, you need my help? I'll write you a check, right? He said, uh, so I said, how much do you need? He said, I need you. Can you be in Colombia in two days? He said, the head trafficker down here has a piece of property he wants to develop into a child brothel sex resort. He needs a few million, about $8 million to build it out. He believes he can make tens of millions of dollars a year selling sex with children to wealthy Americans. He said, this guy has connections with a whole bunch of other traffickers. And we've identified more than 50 children that they have. And somehow we need to get all the children to be brought to the same place at the same time so that we can rescue them all. Because if we just do one sting, then they're going to disappear with the other kids. We've got to get them all together. And these other cities pulling them together at the same time. He said, if you're willing to fly down here and meet with these guys and tell them, I'm willing to fund your resort under one condition. We're going to have a party in a couple of weeks. I'm going to bring all my rich friends and uh, you're going to bring all your inventory, all the children that you currently have. And if, if I like what I see, if my friends have fun at this party, then I'll fund your project. And, uh, and so that's what the plan was. And so he told me, can you be in Columbia in two days? I didn't even have time to fly home. Right. Then I said, well, crap, I go in undercover. What, what do I wear? He says, you need to come down as a wealthy businessman, wealthy investor. I look down at my suit and my $50,000 watch. And I'm like, I'm set. You got the costume right here. Right. And so I, two days later, now here's the thing. I, they didn't have time to set up a fake profile or anything. That first undercover rescue mission, I didn't go down as Paul Stone, Paul Black, Paul Steele, all of these other aliases. This is my first time. I went down as Paul Hutchinson. <laughs> he showed them online. This is the guy, you know, my, my, my social media profile and everything. And I, I was living it arrogant lifestyle. I had pictures of me with Lamborghinis and Ferraris and on nice jets and nice yachts and everything else. And they said, oh, this is the guy that's going to come down. These traffickers are like, oh, he's legit, right? So two days later, I'm sitting at a table this far away from the most evil people that I've ever met. Now, here's what's crazy. I thought when I was on my way down there, I thought, hmm, what does a trafficker look like, right? These probably tattoos on their cheeks, right? Maybe tattoos across their forehead and down and then a bunch of earrings on their nose. And uh, that's what I thought. The first trafficker I met was a businessman in a polo shirt, clean shaven, right? He had a piece of property he had inherited. He wanted to develop into this brothel for kids. The second one was a beautiful young woman. She was, she was running for Miss Cartagena earlier in her life. She was, she was running this fake modeling agency now. And she was, and I thought these can't be traffickers. But when we started talking, it was very evident that, that these were some of the most evil people I had ever met. So what are you thinking then? And why did you take on that mission? Especially if you're living the life of luxury and oblivious to what was going on, because you could have potentially died straight there as well because of these course. people don't fuck about these people are the most ruthless people on the planet because that listen I've, I've interviewed murderers and drug lords and they've kind of you can if you've done that you can kind of make changes and become better and and heal other people but if you do the child stuff and the slavery and the rapes and the prostitution of kids there's no going back for that yeah. You're, yeah. you're evil to the core and did you what was the energy because everything's energy for me See, when you're around these people, was it a calming energy, even though they're businessmen, or did you feel a sort of dark vibe? Well, let me, let me back up two days. Right after I got off that phone call where he invited me down, I said, yeah, yeah, you know, if you can use my help, I'll be there. I had a business partner that was there, and he evidently called the co-founder of the funds with John. Uh, John and I started the, the funds together. And John called me up about an hour, an hour after that phone call. John called me up, and he said, Paul... He said, I, I heard from Don what you're planning to do, going to Columbia. He said, have you thought this through? He said, this is, this is really dangerous. 
He said, you, you could, and he started talking, he says, I don't even have to tell you how dangerous this is. You could get shot. You could, I mean, whole, all, your whole life, he says, you're set. He said, you could keep going on the trajectory we are. The fund is growing. He said, you could, you could sell out, buy an island, be happy the rest of your life. And I said, John, would I really be happy if I bought an island, if I bought a yacht, if I bought all these things? I said, tell me this. If I was doing something else dangerous tomorrow, if I was if I was climbing Everest tomorrow, you and I would have this same conversation, wouldn't we? He goes, yeah, we probably would. I said, and when I'm 95 years old, when I look back on my life, and I say I, I helped build this multi-billion dollar company, and I, I climbed this mountain, and I helped rescue this many children from sex slavery, what? which one of them matters at all? He said, yeah. He said, you're right. I said, if something about me and what I can do, he says, I said, these, these guys, the, the Navy SEALs they have down there can't negotiate a multi-million dollar deal. The, the, the traffickers are going to see through fake money all day long. They're looking for guys like me. They're looking for the Jeffrey Epsteins of the world, right? I, I can go down there and I've got a custom suit that is custom fit for me that is worth more money than their cars, right? So why... If I have something that can, even if we just rescue one child, just one child, that would be worth the risk. He goes, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand. So then two days later, I'm sitting with these guys and we're, we're sitting at this table halfway through this meeting where I'm telling them, look, you know, you bring the kids and, you know, I'll, I'll, if I like it, I'll fund your deal. And I'm asking them about their project. And then one of them leans forward and he said, he said, Pablo, he said, I have a gift for you. I said, really? What's your gift? He, he, he hands me his phone. And there's a picture of an 11-year-old girl on his phone. He said, this is Princess. She's still a virgin. We just took delivery of some. She's my gift for you for this party. Now, in the movie Sound of Freedom, my character was played by Eduardo Verasi, and I and and the homeland security agent came to me and said, "Hey, I've got these kids in Colombia," and I'm like, "No, I don't want to be a part of it." And then he he gave this picture to my driver, and when I'm sitting in my nice car, my driver hands me this envelope, and I see this picture of this little girl, and that changed my heart and made me decide to go. In real life, I was already there. I was face to face with the traffickers, and when he handed me that phone, and I saw that little girl. It, it made it real, real. He starts talking about horrific things I could do to this child. And I realized if we could get these children out before they were ever raped in the first place, while they were still a virgin, that would be a miracle. And something he said made me realize he had more than her. I said, Fuego, I said, you, you, have, more, you have more virgins? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got, I got three or four more. I said, you're bringing those to my party too, right? He goes, oh, no. I said, no. He goes, he said, he said, they're too expensive. Too expensive? I'm already paying this guy $25,000 for, for this party. I'm paying him $500 per child for a minimum of 50 children just for two hours in the afternoon with him. He says, jefe, which is boss in Spanish. He goes, jefe, you already pay $25,000. You want, you want to fuck those other virgins? It's going to cost you maybe $2,000, maybe $5,000 for that little one. It's going to cost you maybe $10,000 more. I was legitimately pissed. My, my arrogance, my ego at the time showed up full force. I've got my nice watch on. I've got my nice cufflinks. I put my hands on my chest. I said, you don't think I can afford an extra $10,000? He said, oh, no, jefe, no. I said, I want every one of those virgins at my party. They damn well better be virgins when they get there. They're not for you. They're for me. You understand? He goes, oh, yeah, jefe, I understand. Now, the female trafficker, she speaks up and she goes, she goes, oh, no, no, we can't, we can't bring the virgins. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. You know, she was speaking in Spanish. We had a translator helping through this, but, but she said, she said, I, I asked why, why, why can't we bring the virgins? She said, they're not, they're not ready yet. She said, if we bring them right now, then they're going to cry. I said, what? It, she said, we have to show them pornography. We have to show them live sex acts. She said, but We'll probably give them drugs, but even, even if we don't prepare them enough, even giving them the drugs, they'll probably still cry. But if you're okay, if they're crying while you're 
having sex with them, then we're going to bring them. That's okay. So she had no heart. It wasn't anything of her worrying about the, tra- the, the children at all. She was just worried what I would think and what my, my guys would think if the children were crying while they were being raped. It was dark. And I thought, I thought this is real. This is real. And then two weeks later is when we did the rescue. And we can talk about that in detail as well. So see when you're sitting there hearing that, what, what's going through your mind? Did you, you, have you got kids, Paul? I do. So as a father myself, this is why I always touch on this kind of stuff and try and expose it as much as I can. But again, you've got to be clever with this, especially myself as well, because the, the, you will just get shut down. Do you know what I mean? I've not got that massive platform or the massive backing to then expose it fully because it's like a chess game. You can do it enough where people understand it, but it's, if you keep doing it enough, then you're you're rattling too many feathers if you're roughing too many feathers if you know what i mean but yeah. when you're sitting there as a father hearing that they've got kids and they'll they brainwash them and groom them to watch live sex and porn and then then get raped if you're what are you thinking i i was sick to my stomach to say the least i thought all the charity work that i've ever done you know i've helped helped feed kids and help kids with cancer, everything else. I thought to myself, if I had, if I had an 11 year old daughter, if that little girl on that picture, if that was my daughter, I would give every penny I have to get her out of hell and to, to destroy the lives of those men that were abusing her. I'd give every penny to destroy their entire operation to, to make sure that they suffered. I would, I would take a bullet to preserve her life, right? Now, the parents of those children don't have the resources that I did, didn't have the, the ability to, maybe didn't have the training either, but it doesn't mean that they love those children any less. And even if the parents were involved, doesn't mean that that child is worth anything less. And so, so I, thought, I thought, if this is really happening, this is really happening for real. People are selling children for these kind of things. There's nothing more important I can do. And, and fast forward, you know, two weeks later, and when we had the, when we had the, the, the sting operation and the, we're, we're sitting there. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of story on it because I think this is, this is just a, some beautiful context. But we're sitting there at this table. These guys had brought 54 children. Almost every one of them were under the age of 16 years old. Many of them were, were, were trafficked from other countries, etc. We put them in a separate part of the house because they were already traumatized enough. We don't want them seeing the money changing hands, the guns coming in to arrest the guys, everything else. So they're in the separate part. We're sitting outside at this table negotiating this deal, undercover cameras so that we can capture everything that these guys are saying so that the children never have to stand trial and witness against these guys. And one of them stands up. And he said, Pablo, I have a gift. I have to show you the gifts that I brought you. And he goes in the house and we could hear some of the children crying. They were so scared of coming to meet me, the man who was going to buy them and, and, and rape them. And about 10 minutes later, he comes out and he has four virgins. Now, this is the first time that I had uh, an actual conversation with children who were being sold. He has four virgins scared to death. One little boy, three little girls. This little boy was 11 years old. They gave him cocaine because he was so scared it was going to hurt. What kind of fucked up monster thinks that that's attractive? Every every cell in my body wanted to just hug these kids and say, you're going to be fine. You're going to see your parents again. I couldn't say that. And they brought this little girl out. The same one that he showed me on the picture. In, in the movie, we separated a couple different rescue stories and brought them all in together. In real life, that girl he showed me on the picture, she was there at the party. He brings her in front of me, standing up while I'm sitting down. She's not much taller than I was sitting down. We were almost eye to eye looking into her eyes. And all I could see was fear. And I took her little hands and I asked her, I said, I said, como te llamas? What's your name? And she didn't, she didn't answer. 
I thought, does she not know her name? And I realized that she, the traffickers were calling her princess. I'm sure her real name wasn't princess. She was trying to figure out what she should say. And I, 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 just, I, I just said, Esta bien, it's okay. And I told the traffickers, it's not time for the party yet. You know, send her back in the house. We still need to negotiate. But I made a commitment at that moment to myself, to God, to that child, that I would dedicate my life to eradicating that evil from the face of the earth. And then is what happened is that the, we, we were supposed to order tequila. And we were supposed to, to as soon as we, we ordered tequila, the, the agents were supposed to come and, and, and rush the party. They didn't. It actually took 45 minutes from the time where we ordered and it was time for the party to start. The problem was when we, we gave the sign, we says, okay, it's time for the party, order tequila. And our, 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 the, the federal agents provided 40 agents for us. Four of them were like our, our waiters and our maids and our, our, our cooks. They're not very good cooks, but they're armed, right? 25 were there to storm the party at the right time. So we told our waiters, all right, get us tequila. And they bring out the tequila. They were supposed to radio them in. They didn't show for 45 minutes. There was a, a delay and some bad things that were happening that a, a lady who was part of the, the, the child protective services didn't make the boat on time and wouldn't let it happen. We didn't know that. We had to delay. And while I was sitting there, I'm like, okay, the traffickers get up. They're like, okay, we're going to go get the kids. We can't have that. We can't have them bring the children out and bring the cocaine out and whatever we had to figure out. All I could think of was delay. And so I said, you know what? You guys have already proven that you could bring the, the children. Now let's do the business plan. You bring those kids out, bring the cocaine out. I'm going to be effed up for the next, you know, next two days. I'm going to have a good time, but let's plan this. And this is where it got really dark. I start planning out this business plan. I'm negotiating with them. I'm saying, okay, this is how much money we're putting in and everything on this. And then I'm, I'm wanting to know the numbers, how they get these children, how much they pay for these children, what they're running them out for. And I told them, I said, okay. And as part of this business plan, I'm writing out, I said, okay, so the, the ones that you brought as virgins, you're charging me $2,000 and 5000 for that, that other one. Is that really what you charge? Or is that you're just trying to rape me because you think I have money? He goes, oh, no, that's what I charge. I said, so then what do you charge after? You know, there's the first time. What do you charge the second time for these, these children? And the female trafficker said, oh, no. She said, it doesn't drop immediately. She said, you can rent them out as a virgin more than once. I said, really? What, what, what does that mean? How do, you, how do you rent them out as a virgin more than once? She said, it only costs $200 to take him into a doctor and have him sew back their hymen. I thought, holy shit, this happens? This happens. What, what has to happen to a person to get to the point where they see another human being as as a piece of trash, as, as worse than an animal where you would pay for that surgery. This kind of thing's happened out there and people need to understand that the world is that dark and I've seen it firsthand. But the most beautiful moment of my life was after the agents came, stormed the party, arrested everybody, 30 Child Protective Services people came in with the children and they started laughing, they started singing with the children. And that sound of freedom was the most beautiful sound that I ever heard, especially compared to the crying that I heard half an hour before. That's why we named the movie The Sound of Freedom, was, was the sound of that, that, the, the, the singing and the, the laughter of the children after they were rescued that day. Yeah, I had a man on Ian. He was an undercover pedophile from the UK. He went, and I couldn't understand at the time why he would want to do that job. But he went and done a job and saved a kid, 10-year-old boy. And this 10-year-old boy actually believed that he was a prostitute. And he'd get it and sleep with like seven men. He says they were like junkies looking for their fix. And he had to pretend to be one and look at the videos and the photos. And, and I couldn't understand. I asked him why, as a father, why. I don't know if I could have the strength to, to stay sane. But he says, as soon as, because he'd done it for over 20 years, and he says to me, look, James, as soon as I saved that one boy, how could I walk away? 
yeah. who else is going to do it? How could yeah. I walk away? In that moment there, I realised, wow, what yeah. a brave man, because his head is gone. He actually just took a heart attack a few months ago, and you could see the strain and the stress in the man's face, but 20 years in a job saving, he saved hundreds of innocent kids, and this was the UK. Where, see, when the, these kids are getting trafficked, where's the hotspot they're trafficking them from, or is it just all around the world? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's, you know, there's there's hot spots in, um, you know, Southeast Asia, in Thailand. There's there's kids everywhere there. There's a, it, any second and third world country. There's there's poverty that plays a role. But here's the thing for parents to understand. You know, people will leave the movie Sound of Freedom and they'll say, okay, you know, what do I want? I want to help. I want to do something. You know, where can I go? Where where can I go to find the traffic kids? I want to go save the kids. You know, the worst thing you can do is go be a Rambo, right? And go down to Columbia and try to rescue kids. You're, you're going to get shot and you're, you're probably, you're probably going to get arrested as well. The best thing that you can do is go home and hug your children. And people say, well, how, how is that going to help if I, you know, it's going to help big time because here's what happens. The majority of children that get sucked into trafficking come from, from broken homes, runaways, uh, a broken foster care program where these children are alone. It's yes, like what you see in the movie. Yeah, there's, there's children that will, will um, uh, be taken from a, a healthy home and put on a, a container ship and taken somewhere, but that's very, very rare. The majority of them come from these broken families. The thing that healthy families need to be aware of, though, is this. 10 million children being sold is one thing. Billions of children in their own homes, billions of children are being abused in some way. And so somehow we need to, we need to give the safety to them. What happens is this. It, you need to have a relationship with your children where where they can easily come to you and they can say, okay, dad, I, I feel uncomfortable when you make me hug Uncle Harry, or I feel uncomfortable when I go to this, this friend's house because her, her, her brother, you know, when he hugs me, he touches my bum, or, or I feel uncomfortable with this babysitter because this babysitter, is, is she's showing us pornography, and she says that we, we, we should trust her more than you. These are grooming behaviors. And it's important for us as parents to realize that the number one risk to your own children is not some guy in another country that's going to take your children and take off with them. The number one risk is, is your own neighborhood and your extended family. 92% of children who, who endure sexual abuse, 92% of them, it comes from a familial contact of some sort. Keeping them safe and is, is the priority. Because here's what happens. Children that are being sold and trafficked, we pull them out of hell. We get them into a healthy environment. We get immediately get the psychological help that they need and, and, and get them into a healthy environment and they, can re, they rebound very quickly. Children in your own home who are being abused by their uncle or by their neighbor or something like that, and they never tell any, anybody about it, then it, it's hidden as this dark energy inside of their soul for years and years and years. And they're 20 and 30 years old, and they're holding on to that pain. And it shows up in every area of their life. And with those ones, we need to go and help them. Usually we have guided meditation um, ceremony type experiences where we take them deep into their subconscious and go in and, and healing that 10-year-old. Because that's, that's what we need to do as humanity. We need to help heal the 10-year-old inside of each 20 and 30, 40-year-old man or woman who's holding on to that pain. Help them heal. Help them love that 10-year-old. Help them go on their own child rescue mission, their own undercover rescue mission in their own heart. My goal is not just to rescue the 10-year-old in, in the clutches of a trafficker in, in Colombia. My goal now is to help each adult rescue the 10-year-old inside of their own heart, inside of their own soul, inside of their own families. If we can do that, then, then we can heal the world, not just eradicate child trafficking. How much were they selling the kids for? Depends. Because if you're a billionaire rich man, I'd imagine they put the prices up, but... Yeah, it's not just a it's not just a rich man's game. This it's it's from the bottom to the top. It's all it's, the way up. It's, it's everywhere. So 
How much were they selling the kids to the? They, they were selling the children to me for between two hundred to five hundred dollars, and a thousand, two thousand, three thousand for the virgins. But let me tell you this: we have a. There was a a, a little girl in uh, in Peru recently that was she was bringing in her traffickers told her that she needed to bring in a thousand dollars a day or she would get beat up. Now, she was only making between 20 and $50. She was 15 years old. She was charging between 20 and $50 per pedophile that was down there. In order to get to that thousand, she had to sleep with 20 or 30 men a night just to be able to hit that goal that these traffickers were making her, her stand up to. Now, her background story, I think, is important for the listeners to understand. You know, people say, where do these kids come from? Her mother died when she was eight years old. Her father was uh, was a raging alcoholic and and had no ability to care care for her. She was she was sent to live with her uncle and her aunt. By the time she was ten, her uncle was raping her, and when she brought it up, her her aunt said, "What are you ungrateful? Why are you, why are you trying to destroy our family and making up these lies? You're ungrateful that we're giving you a home." And so she was just kept it inside and was continually raped by her uncle, and she was the perfect victim. For traffickers, she had low self-esteem. She had a broken home, broken family. She didn't have any friends. She was walking home alone from school every day. The traffickers identified that. One of the older ones that that was at, at working with the traffickers was a teenage boy at the time. And he was telling her, hey, I'll be your boyfriend. I'll take care of you. And then the older ones were like, hey, well, we'll buy you some things if you want. They convinced her to leave her uncle, which was easy for her to be convinced she was being raped every day. And they say she was in Ecuador. And they took her, they, they took her to Peru. And when they got there, they took away her, her identification and her phone. They went and bought her really sexy clothes and then took her and introduced her to the other girls that were there. They were all working for these traffickers. And she was told she had to make a thousand dollars a day or she would get beat up. Three separate times she got beat up to the point where she was sent to the hospital. But the people at the hospital didn't recognize the signs that she was being trafficked. The third time somebody recognized the signs and she, we had already worked on another case and had taken down a trafficking ring in Ecuador and followed where some of these kids went. So my wife, who works with the aftercare with the Child Liberation Foundation that we, our foundation, she was there working with, with she went into Peru. She met with this girl. She, she helped her. Actually, she was back in Ecuador at this time and she did some of the follow-up with her. But this happens all the time. But in, that's a long answer to your question of how much they earn. But you're right. There were people paying $20, $50 for these horrible things with these children. What about adrenochrome? How true is this? People ask me that a lot. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of evil in this world. There is, there, is, there is evil. There are people who will do, you know, these, these satanic rituals, adrenochrome and, you know, scaring the kids to this point. What I'll say is this. I haven't seen people drink in the blood. Okay. I haven't seen that firsthand. What I have seen is bad enough. An eight-year-old being sold for sex, an 11-year-old being sold, the, the, the organ harvesting organizations that we have, have been a part of taking down, that's bad enough. Yes, those things happen. I have, I have operators who have seen them. I haven't seen it personally, so I can't verify that. The, 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 the battle that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood. The battle that we're fighting is against the darkest things of this world, against the, the most evil things you can think of. And, and this darkness continues. If somebody will go to that length, how long, how, what length will they go to, to, to try to preserve their own life longevity and all this bullshit that people are trying to do. So yes, I believe that stuff happens, but I haven't seen it firsthand. Is a lot of the parents selling their kids as well from these third world countries? In some cases, yes. In, uh, in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, more than half the children that uh, were rescued by the different organizations we worked with, more than half those children were, were sold by their own families. And uh, many cases, trafficked children the parents are involved in some way, um, or the parents are just oblivious. 
You know, the majority of these children are not kidnapped and sold and whatnot. A lot of these kids sleep in their own beds at night and, and are being manipulated through fear. The, the traffickers are like, you know, do you, you say anything to anybody? We, we uh, you know, we'll, we'll get your sister, we'll hurt your mother, whatever else. So, yes, it happens a lot with kids that are still living at home, or in some cases, the parents are involved. Why is America one of the worst places, do you think? Yeah, America is the number one producer and consumer of child pornography in the world. And there are hundreds of thousands of children being sold in America. Here's what it is. When I first saw traffickers, thinking that they were all a bunch of druggies and, and a bunch of, of uh, you know... Uh, that lower level of society, and and they weren't, they 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 weren't they weren't tattoos and earrings and all this stuff. They weren't. They, I I they and I tried to ask myself, what's the common thread? What what do all of, of the seventy undercover rescue missions that I've done? What is the common thread between all these traffickers? And that common thread was this: it was greed and arrogance, greed and arrogance, where their greed to the point where 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 they wanted money so bad that it was okay to destroy the lives of these children to get that money. And arrogance to the point where they thought that their happiness and their money and their lifestyle was more important than other people. So the answer is, when you have a country where there's a huge percentage of people who are living in greed and arrogance, you're going to end up having trafficking. You're going to end up having a demand for children. Because the very second that we see ourselves as better than somebody else, that we see somebody else as a commodity in any way, this is why pornography is very damning. Because when you take a woman from a divine feminine to an object, you start going down a dark road, right? The very second that I look at another human being as less than myself because of their their financial status, because of the color of their skin, because of their gender. Anytime that I'm looking at somebody as lower than me, I'm playing in that same energy that those traffickers were. This is what I saw when I was first down there. And I, I hadn't broken any laws. I was never attracted to children, but I was, I was an arrogant asshole. I, I, was, I was money and parties and everything else. And that's what the traffickers were looking for. That's why I worked so well undercover is because they were looking for guys that were big, arrogant, write this check, whatever, that were paying for some of these parties. But even the more people that were, that were broke, when they're, when they're looking at another human being as less than themselves, then you can continue down that dark road. Because they say over 80% of porn is, is abuse. It's a low vibrational thing, and people who watch it, it's scientifically proven, you are depressed, it darkens the amygdala, where you are depressed if you're watching porn, and everything is vibration and it's a low vibration unless a lot of people don't know that as well listen i used to watch porn back in the day and you're thinking it's normal your hormones but once you start understanding life and soul ties and sexual energy exchange everything's it's it's crazy to think how backwards thinking some people are it's not that they're bad there's just so a lot of people are oblivious to what they're consuming and that goes with eating and drinking or, or even the way they speak but See, when you're going through that then, Paul, when you, after your first rescue mission, what was life like then? Did your whole life totally flip? It, it flipped in the fact that I changed my, I was, I was now passionate about helping the children. But it was still a couple of years where I continued in, in a degree of arrogant energy, right? I was, I was, I wasn't Paul Hutchinson. Back in the beginning, I was Paul fucking Hutchinson, right? I'm, I'm, I've got a multi-billion dollar company. I can, I've got girls. I've got a lifestyle. And, and, and now I was also rescuing children, right? Now, seeing that what was happening, yes, it started to change me. It started, I, I thought, this is dark. This is really dark what's going on. But man, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to be this savior. I'm going to go save these kids. I'm going to pay for these things and whatever else. And, and I continued for the next year and it was actually really effective. 
in, in, in having the traffickers come and bring out these children and stuff. It was very, very effective. And I continued to play that role of, uh, of this wealthy guy who then our undercover operators would say, hey, we're setting up this party for this wealthy guy. And, you know, I took down my real profile. I had no social media. The real me didn't. I had this, this uh, Paul Stone, in fact, it was funny as shit. This is funny. So my, my personal assistant, I told her, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this, this undercover stuff. I need you to take down anything related to Paul Hutchinson online anywhere. I'm, I'm going to be, I, I still want to be undercover. I, I want to still be Paul undercover because I don't want to, when somebody says, hey, Jack, and I don't know what they're talking, I want to I respond easily because I don't want to break my, you know, mess up there. So set up a, set, and she's sitting there typing, right? Taking notes. I said, so I want you to, to set up a new profile for me on Facebook and Instagram and everything else under the, under the name uh, Paul Johnson. And she's, she stops talking. I stops typing and she looks up at me and she said, you have a chance to redefine yourself and you're going to be Paul Johnson. She said, how about Paul Stone? She, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's badass, Right. So she sets up this Paul Stone profile and it was, it was, you know, I, I already had pictures of me with yachts and Ferraris and all this stuff. She puts all this profile together and, and sets up all this stuff. Well, two years later, I had been doing undercover stuff. I had now been chosen not just to play the wealthy guy, but to go deep cover, to go face to face at two in the morning with the trafficker, setting up a party for somebody or going in posing as a doctor in a jungle or, you know, these were all things that I did on these, these undercover missions. And, and in that place, I got face to face with traffickers at, and showing me exactly where these children were being held. And that really started to change me. One mission, I was in Dominican Republic, and this, this trafficker, he was an escaped convict from the U.S., and he, he had brought us some children, and then he said, now I have a, I have a mother who's selling. She has a 9-year-old and an 11-year-old, and she, she wants to sell them to you to, you know, if you want to take them back to the U.S. And, and maybe have them work in a brothel or something else. So I'm on the phone with this mother. He connects me with her. She's selling her children for $10,000 each, which was, I thought, this is greed and to the point where you think it's okay to sell your children for, for, for that much. And then she said something to me that really changed everything. She said to me, she said, I need you to make me a promise when you take these girls back to the U.S., I need you to make me a promise. And I thought that she was a compassionate mother and there was something that was going to come through where she would say, I need you to, to be nice to them. I need you to take care of them. I need you, whatever. I, I, what was this promise going to be? She said, I need you to make me a promise. And I said, what's the promise? She said, when you're done with them, I need you to be done with them. I don't want this ever to come back on me. Meaning she wanted us to go with them. Yes. And I, and I thought, what has to happen in somebody's life where $20,000 is worth it for her to say those words and, and be that broken in her life? And, and things started to change for me. And, and I, I started seeing money in a different way and arrogance in a different way and, and how we interact with each other. And what changed for me is the operator who I was with on that mission, his name was Andy, dear, dear friend. And he was same energy, same lifestyle, everything. And he said, Paul, and, and that kind of broke him, that mission as well. And a few months later, he called me up him and my other undercover operator, Jimmy. And they said, do you trust us? I said, yeah, I put my life in danger with you. I trust you. They said, you need to come to our house or to this, this actually wasn't their house. It was this event and this, uh, yeah, we flew out of the country, but they said, you need to come to this, this ceremony. Because my life was, I was messed up. I was on my second marriage. I was, I was having these parties and everything. And they said, you need to come and, and experience something. 
And so I did. We went, went to this place, this doctor who had traveled around the world looking at different kinds of therapy options, some different holistic therapy, some things that could, that could really help people release their trauma. And, and I grew up in a very orthodox Christian religious home where I didn't, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I know no drugs, nothing. I didn't nothing. I mean, I was from a drug standpoint, those are the those are next to the devil, right? And alcohol was next to the devil. All of these things were like horrible things that you could do. And so so I I that's how I, I had been raised. And they they brought me into what they call a guided meditation plant medicine healing experience. It was using, there's the, the US government back in the 60s and the late 60s threw a lot of these things under the bus. They classified them as schedule one drugs. And I'm, I'm talking about, about psychedelics, things like, like uh, psilocybin and, and uh, sassafras and white lily and, and, and mistletoe. These, these different tools that, that some, a, 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 a trained facilitator can use to help release trauma I have seen people in 24 hours get more out of an experience like that than 10 years of therapy. So they brought me into this, this experience. And it was the most transformational 24 hours of my life in all ways. What happened? They that they that we came in with this intention, where this intention was, okay, what does the the 2.0 version of me look like, and what what kind of things do I want to release? And at this point, I was really starting to take a look at my life through a different lens, and I felt in every cell of my body, I felt the pain that my children felt when I had cheated on their mom. I felt it. And it was really hard. And it was really dark. And it was really heavy. And I, and I, had, I had some headphones on and I, I was listening to this, what they call these journey music, right? I was listening to this, this, this you, know, you know, meditation music stuff. And I was in the pit of hell. And it was so dark and it was so heavy. And, and I, I changed the playlist to what I, what I call my, my spiritual list, right? And my Jesus list at the time, right? And I could feel myself being pulled out of this depths of hell and cleansing all this crap that I was holding on to. Then I changed the playlist back to this meditation music and whoa, it took me back down because I was on, on what we call the medicine. I was on psilocybin at the time and it pulled me back down. And I could feel the pain of different people in my life that, that my choices had affected in, in, a, in a harsh way where I didn't see them for who they were, where I, all right, I hurt them in some way because of my greed, because of my arrogance. And I went back and forth and taking myself to the pit of hell and then pulling myself out. And it was such a beautiful, transformational, healing experience in forgiving myself, in forgiving people who had harmed me, in releasing myself from that negative energy and getting myself to a higher level of vibration in my life seeing my, my choices for what they were, but not living in this state of guilt, not living in this state of arrogance, not living in this state of fear, not living in this state of anger, and pulling myself through that was, was the beginning of my transformation in every area of my life to the point where I could qualify for a healthy relationship with a woman instead of the unhealthy ones that I had been cultivating for years, where I could qualify for really healthy interactions with people that weren't based on look at me and who I am, but being authentic in every way was, was, was something that made all the difference for me. In fact, John Hopkins University did a study. They said that 76% of people who do a guided meditation plant medicine, psilocybin um, journey experience, 76% of them say it was the number one most transformational 24 hours of their life. And 100% of them said it was within the top five in their lifetime. So I'm a huge advocate. We've, we've, we've been working on trying to change the laws in the U.S. to allow people. I'm not, I'm not a fan of people just taking mushrooms and going on a high somewhere, you know, 
yeah, if you want to go talk to God, that's one thing. If you want to deal with your trauma, if you want to transform your life, if you want to work through your childhood issues, if you want to learn how to live a life of purpose in every way, get somebody who is trained, a guided meditation, a, a facilitator. So we have we have places in Latin America that we take people to. I like taking men. I like taking like 10 or 15 men who all are living in the same energy, whether it's they're all addicted to porn or they're all addicted to, to money or they're all have childhood issues, whatever it is, and bring them in. And then I bring loving human beings who have been through that before and worked through it through the same tools. And we create this safe space for four or five days. And they do a fully, uh, 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 fully integrated, a fully, they, they turn off their cell phones. They just unplug from everything and they fully immersive transformational healing experience they go back as completely new human beings. How do you think you would be now if you never done that? Because your head must have been all over the place seeing kids and making deals with the devils. It was, I don't know that 30 years of therapy would, would help fix what I had gone through. I was, I had seen, I had seen things that I, I had I had green berets that were three hundred plus missions that in in and seeing the worst part of humanity, what they thought was the worst part of humanity, with people shooting each other and blood and horrible things, that went and saw children being sold, and it rocked them to the core. And I was holding on. I, I thought that I was okay. I'm through that, but no, I was holding on to that energy because that energy of these traffickers and this sex and all this just negative stuff that you know I was. You, you don't find traffickers in the Ritz Carlton, right? We're in we're in strip clubs. We're in we're in these darkest areas of the planet. We're talking about horrible things and 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 seeing children. See, uh, conversations with mothers like I talked about, you know, selling her kids for $10,000, saying when you're done with them, be done with them. It was heavy. It was dark. And I was compensating for it with, with low e vibration energy and what I thought was healthy. Well, I'm just going to, you know, buy more things. I'm going to have a nicer car. I'm going to have a nicer house. I'm going to have sexier girlfriends and stuff. And I was trying to, to calm that negativity with, with more negativity. Right. And, and so by being able to go through that and cleanse a lot of that energy, I was able to come to a place of healing, healing myself from being in the pit of hell, healing myself from some, from disastrous relationships that were, that were super unhealthy in, in a lot of ways, healing myself from all of the bad choices that I had made for years and years and freeing myself from that. And it was, it was beautiful. My life now is liberating humanity. You can find me everywhere online. Just type in liberating humanity. That's what it's about because people say, well, liberating from what? From the same stuff that I was not liberated. We, 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 we think that slavery is, okay, these kids are human trafficking. No, we're all in a form of slavery. Every one of us are in a form of slavery in some way. We're a slavery to our porn addictions. We're a slavery to our alcohol addictions. We're a slavery to low self-esteem or anger issues. We're a slavery to, to, to our, our, our past and our childhood trauma. So we're slavery to generational trauma, right? There's, there's so many things that, are, that we're holding on to that aren't ours. Not my shit, not my shit, right? Release it. For example, I, I, I grew up in a, in a home where where I was taught healthy principles. But my, my father, as I was growing up, God bless him, he never once said the word, I love you, Paul. He never once hugged me with a loving, warm embrace from my father. And for all of my childhood, my teenage years, the first time that I ever heard the words, I love Paul, was he was talking to a group as I was leaving on a two-year service mission. He said, you know, I, I really love Paul for, for this and this and this. That was the first time I ever heard it. I was 19 years old, right? Now, where did that come from? His mother told him that he wasn't the favorite child. In fact, he was the least favorite child. Where did that come from? She, she came from a line of royalty. 
She was one of the Stuarts of England, right? In the 1600s, they were this ruling class. I follow my genealogy back. I go all the way back to guys like William Wallace was a direct relative. And, and um, you know, there's, there's all of these great kings and stuff. I go all the way back into the, some of the, the Caesars. And I ask myself, what kind of pain did they have in not saying I love you or not, not showing authenticity and having to show this, this, this image that wasn't true? And how many generations back there was, there was rape, there was abuse and things that carried through from a generational standpoint that I need to release as well. All of us have that. All of us are, are slaves in some way that we can release that energy and come to a place of finding purpose in our life finding finding peace in our life. This is this is something we're seeing in the Middle East right now, okay? You've got you've got all the wars that are happening in Ukraine. You've got the wars that are happening in in Israel. Where is this war coming from? Do you think that if you took a a, a child that was born in Gaza and a child that was born in 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 uh, in, in Palestine and if you put these children all together, and you don't have the integration from their parents telling them that that person is bad and that person is evil and we need to kill them, those children will grow up as friends, right? We're inundated with all this crap saying that I'm better than this person because I believe differently and they, they need to worship differently and they have the wrong God. This is, you know, we were in Israel for a while and I was like, I was in Jerusalem and I realized, wow, we've got millions of people fighting over a rock, Right? This, this dome of the rock, this, well, this is where Muhammad ascended into heaven, and this is where Abraham sacrificed his son, and this is where Jesus, you know what? All of those men taught that we need to love each other. It was, it was for years, the, their, their teachings were changed and skewed in this way that creates division, that creates hatred. We can, the only way we're going to heal humanity is to release that low vibration energy that, that, that allows us to think that another person is less than us in some way, that it's okay for us to, to be gratified in some sexual way, some financial way, some whatever, at the expense of another person. It's the only way we're going to fix this, is for us to come together in this place of, of love and unity and peace, starting with loving ourselves and healing ourselves. What's the worst thing you've seen, Paul, while going undercover? The worst thing I've seen? Oh, I've got so many. I've got so many. I, I, there's, um, there was a, uh, there was a documentary that was done on one of the rescues that I, I, I did in, in Haiti. Um, at the end of that, there was now, at the time the documentary was done, I was still undercover. So the only see, time you see me, my face is blurred and I'm laughing with the traffickers. You would hate my guts if you didn't know who I was, right? And at the end of that, there's this little girl. She's 14 years old. She's sitting on a rocking chair. She's holding a teddy bear. She was taken when she was seven. Her parents were killed in the earthquake in Haiti. Nobody knew she was alive. And she was sold for sex 20 or more times a day for seven years. I was the first person to, to find her from the team. I was, we had worked our way up to what I call a, a level three trafficker. These are the ones who physically hold the children in, in, in chains, in captivity, right? Not chains, but in captivity. So, so it was a female trafficker. Her name was Cho and a uh, big heavy lady. And I'm sure she was raped as a child. She was trafficked herself, et cetera. But, but a bunch of male traffickers working for her took us to this really dark, dangerous area of town. And, uh, and she sticks a key in this door. It's about, it's about four feet wide. It's about seven, eight feet tall. This red steel door sticks a key and it opens it up. And there's a dirt hallway that's that's there uh dimly lit cobwebs and and multiple cell doors down the left hand side no windows no access to the outside world except for this small steel door sticks a key in one of these steel doors and as it opens there's a uh, a bed it's not even a bed it was a it was a steel plank it was metal plank and it was it was held to the wall with a with a chain so you could fold it up because it was a little five foot by six foot room and there was a dirty 
holy blanket that was sitting on that. And to the left, on the ground, on a concrete block, was this little girl. That was the conditions she was in. You wouldn't, you wouldn't keep your worst enemy's dog in a situation. This is, it was horrible. This little girl, she looked up at us with this, this kind of thing happens all the time type of a thought. At the end, there was multiple doors. At the end, there was this, this uh, queen size mattress in this bigger room with condoms all around where the unthinkable would happen. That little girl didn't say one word for two weeks after she was rescued. Her very first words she said were, I didn't think anybody would come. But she gave up hope six years before. And what makes me so mad is that every single man who walked through that door for seven years was there to rape her. We were the first, me and Andy were the first two that walked through that door that didn't have that intention. They say one in 30s get pedophile ten tendencies, one in every street. What's that? They say one in 30s get pedophile tendencies on this planet, one in every street. See when you're going through all that then, Paul, and your head must be fried and you're saving kids. When did you ever, how did this, how did you function now? I know you've done psychedelics. I know you've, yeah. you're in a good place. And But how do you, because the thoughts will always be there till the day you die, I'd imagine. Yeah. But how do you not block them out? If you, do you face those thoughts or do you, or do you try and block them out? Because they are a bit, they are too dark, to be honest. Here's, um, here's my real answer. I'll tell you how I found them and how I keep in that space of not going into the darkness. Um, I remember one time I had a, I had a new team, I had some, some guys, they're all, you know, tattooed up. There were some ex green berets, Navy seal guys. Right. And, um, and they were, they were kind of leading, trying to find, you know, traffickers. It was about two in the morning. We hadn't found anybody. I said, guys, can I take, can I take the lead? Are you good with that? And they said, yeah, yeah, we heard you're really good at this. You know, I had done about 30 undercover missions and found kids every single time. I said, okay. I said, you need to follow exactly what I say. I said, first things first, I need you to understand that I believe in God. I said, most people believe in a supreme being. Some people call it the universe or, or, or Heavenly Father, Jehovah, um, even Allah. You know, there, there's, there's people that call their version of God whatever they want to. I said, God exists and cares more about these children than you and I ever could and knows exactly where they are. So if you're okay with it, even if you're not okay with it, I'm going to start out by asking for some help. So I quiet my mind. We offer up a prayer. Here we are, you know, downtown Port-au-Prince, Haiti, the most darkest voodoo infested place on the planet, right? And then I said, now I need you to understand how I see fear and faith. Most people think that faith is a religious thing, right? They go to church, ask God to fix things in their life that they don't believe are going to be fixed. That's not faith, right? Faith is faith is a is an energetic tool. Okay, it's a it's a law of the universe. It's is simply this: it's the unwavering conviction that what I want to have happen will happen. Your 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 actions are powerful. Your words are powerful. Your thoughts are even more powerful than you can imagine. And, and the problem is, is that people have a, a hard time with unwavering faith about anything. Should I marry this woman? Should I start this new job? Should I move to this new country? Whatever. I said, I said, with this 
I don't care if God is a cloud or a mountain or a light at the middle of the universe. I don't, I don't, it says there is not my version of source, my version of God, my version of, of positive energy in the, in the universe is not okay with an eight-year-old being raped. So it's easy for me to have unwavering conviction that we're going to find those kids. And, and it's also important to understand that fear and faith cannot exist in the same person at the same time. It's because in some ways it's the same power, right? People who believe that bad things will happen to them actually attract that. People who believe that good things will happen actually attract that or create that in their life. And our mind and our soul and our actions and our words are all connected to everything around us, to each other. You and I are energetically connected heart to heart. We're, we're communicating. Our vibrations of our words are going back and forth, but we're both connected to the wall, to this microphone, to the people around us. Our words carry power. They carry the ability to heal, to transform, and they are infinite. And so understanding this energetic force of the, of the universe and the power of, of omnipotence that is in our own lives, being able to tie into that every single undercover rescue that I did, we weren't following logic and protocol. I truly believe that we are being led. And in, in that energy, it, it created this bubble of safety from the darkness. Uh, Halloween, you know, in the US we celebrate Halloween where I'm, I guess they do that in Europe too, right? Yeah, you yeah, dress yeah, up yeah. as ghouls and yeah, go yeah. goblins and stuff. So a few years ago, I dressed up as a, as a, as a, as an angel in devil's clothing, right? I was pure white. I had lights on and angel wings and stuff. And then I put on a black cloak with a ghoul head, you know? And so on the outside, I look super just scary. And all I had to do is just open it. And inside I was pure light and white. That's how I saw being able to go into the pit of darkness. You, we had to have, I saw guys that didn't have that foundation that it affected them. That it that it was it was dark and whatever, I I believe that that relationship with with the divine that 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 purity of light and faith was the only thing that that made it so that I didn't self destruct. How hard is it to get convictions in these third world countries? Because the UK laws are terrible. People can change their name for less than fifteen pounds and. They've done some of the sickest things. They're getting community service. They're not even getting prison time. How hard is that? Listen, if you've saved the kids, it's good. That's the best thing ever. But it's the ringleaders you want to put in prison. But no doubt they can still work from prison. But how hard is it to get convictions in these other countries? Well, that's one thing we're that's one thing we're working on right now is changing policy in a lot of countries. In fact, for the last 10 years, those are things that we've been working on. I remember in the early rescue missions, if we didn't say the exact right words, then it was, it was thrown out. For example, we were in one country and we had, uh, we had found uh, six traffickers selling 20 children. And the prosecutor, before we even did the sting, the prosecutor looked at the, the, the recordings of, of what we had done with these guys and said, you know what? I'm not going to prosecute those guys. Why not? Well, because when they offered you 18-year-old girls, one of your operators said, do you have any girls that are, you have any children that are younger for sale? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got 12-year-olds. Is that what you want? Yeah. They already had them. They were selling the kits. But because they actually said, do you have any younger? They were going to identify it as, as, you know, entrapment in some way. Really? That's crap. In another, in another country, they, um, they, had, they, they made us at the time of the sting. I had to bring, traumatize these kids more. I had to bring a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old that were there, that were brought by the traffickers that part of their law in that country was that the, the children had to actually see the money changing hands for their, for their services. I'm like, listen, we've got video and audio of these guys saying, yes, this is why we have these kids here. This is what, what we're selling them for. This is how much. Why did the children ever have to stand trial? We were just in, in Thailand just literally three weeks ago. 
And they they had worked on changing some of the laws there because the children were re-traumatized so many times that they never they nobody could go to jail because the kids had to stand on stage and tell this. And over and over, they're telling their trauma story, and it's re-traumatizing these kids. So like, no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get this on video once from the child. We're gonna we're gonna record. Uh, we're gonna find other ways to guarantee that we have the evidence that we need without re-traumatizing the children as part of it. So when we went into countries, we would say, listen, we will, and usually we'll start with the head of the federal police or the president because the local cops in a lot of areas are involved and 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 getting paid by some of the traffickers, et cetera. So we have to be careful there. So we start with these guys and we say, listen. We will pay for everything, we will do all the work, and we will give you all the credit. Your people are going to think you're heroes because they, they, they're going to see you arresting us and the bad guys. All we ask for is that the bad guys stay in jail for good. They don't get around your system, number one. Number two, we have full access to the children, getting them rehabilitated and back to their families. Unfortunately, there's a lot of money involved and a lot of corruption in different countries. That documentary I told you about on, on Haiti, the, those traffickers, after we arrested them, ended up paying $80,000 to four corrupt judges to be let out of prison. To put that into perspective, the average income in Haiti is like $500 a year. 80000 is like millions. And they were let out of prison. We, we had to fly the first lady, the, the attorney general, and the, 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 the head of the police to the U.S., showed them the entire case inside out. And the, the head of the federal police stands up. He goes, I don't, I don't care if I lose my, my job. I don't care if I lose my life. I'm going to fix the corruption in my country. So this is what takes. Good people have to stand up and say no. We're done with the corruption. We, these guys need to stay in jail. They're not going to be out re-traumatizing children in the next hour. What made me so mad is that in the United States, you could go to jail longer for having something like like psilocybin it's that, that can you know, help people heal that's, that's less, less dangerous than table sugar, right? But, but, but you could go to prison for longer by having some of that than you could for raping a child? Are you kidding me? So yeah, the laws need to change to really fix the problem. How many kids actually go missing worldwide every year? Is it 2 million? Is it 10 million? Yeah. Because the figures seem to change, but I believe it's it's well over 5 million at least anyway. Yeah. Because obviously the kids that go missing the year before, they've still got those kids. They, they'll just... People need to understand with the trafficking and the, the money that's involved, it's not only the selling the kids for sex, but once they're done with the kids or teenagers or what, they're then killing them and stealing their organs. Like it's such a yeah big business. And for me, it's took over the drug trade. Um, and I was told this two years ago by Ollie Ollerton, a good man. He was um, ex special forces in the UK and he went to Thailand, but the police didn't want him to work, so they had to do the jobs themselves but they had to and they end up getting chased out of thailand because they never had a license to be working there but he couldn't leave because he's seen so much destruction and what was going on in the child yeah trade how many kids actually go missing per year paul well it's it's like you say the numbers all over the place it's everywhere um, you know, even even in human trafficking, you hear the number as low as 25 million, as high as 40 million, you know, as a whole. Um, but it's really hard to get a handle on that. Just in the United States alone, just the kids crossing the border, there's 85,000 that are missing, that, 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 that they don't have paperwork as to where these kids are going, right? And, and, and when you have broken families, when you have a foster care program, you got runaways, you've got you've got missing kids everywhere. So so in the in the movie Sound of Freedom, we talk about, you know, two million children a year are being sucked into the deepest recesses of hell. Those are just new stuff that's being sucked in. You're exactly right. There's millions, there's millions of children that are being exploited in these horrible ways. Now, again, the 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 dark numbers, the really big numbers, is not just the children that are being taken from a healthy family and, and being trafficked and whatnot. The big numbers of this travesty are the number of children who sleep in their own beds at night that are being trafficked in some way, 
right? That their parents are making money off them, the babysitters making money off them, there's guys at schools, et cetera, that are that are that are sexually trafficking these children. That number is millions, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of children that are going through those kind of challenges in in their own homes. But outside of that, you're right. There's there's organ harvesting that is that is happening everywhere. I I remember one of our operations. We uh, we we were going in to take down uh, an organ harvesting um, operation, and because we didn't know if there was going to be, you know, people kids that needed to be sewed up or whatever, we we took a we took a uh, an army surgeon with us who had done some some work in the military and was a doctor as well, and I asked him. I said, part of me understands how some sick person can be, you know, addicted to hardcore pornography and then child pornography and then want to act out on these fantasies and go the children. I said, I see where that demand is coming from. Where is the demand coming from for the organ harvesting? I mean, this this seems like where's that demand coming from? And he told me this. He said, Paul, he said, understand this in the United States. He said, and, and it's worse worldwide, but just in the United States alone, he said, less than 50% of the organ recipients have proper paperwork as to where that organ came from at the time that they're actually receiving it because everything's moving so fast, et cetera. He said, now, I'm not saying that half the children and, and, and half the people in the U.S. come from situations like that. He said, I'm just saying that the system is flawed and less than half of them even have the right paperwork. He said, well, here's where the money comes from. He said, you're a, you're a wealthy family in the U.S. You have a daughter who's dying of some, some kidney disease. If she doesn't get a kidney transplant within the next month, she's going to die. You have the money to pay for anything you want to, and you're number 257 on the list that you're waiting for a kidney at that, the hospital that you're at here in the U.S. And you're told, you know what? You can go to Mexico. You can go to Thailand. You can go to China. You can go anywhere and you can go to Haiti. You can go and you can pay to be moved to the front of the list instead. Now, as a good parent, you'll do anything to save your child. And if you're told, I'm going to be moving to the front of the list, inside you're hoping, okay, I'm at the front of the list. This is a poor child in this other country that got killed in a car accident and they're an organ donor. And so I'm just going to move to the front of the list there and put my child there. But the chances of that one in that third world country, especially because you're paying $50,000 or $100,000 to be put on the front of that list, that money is going to some of these operations. These guys can make big, big, big money selling the, the organs of these children to people who are willing to pay for them. The sound of freedom, Paul, like I say, it's changed the game. It's shed light onto things that nobody wants to talk about because let's be honest, it's very touchy subjects. Nobody wants to speak about these issues because you then become a target. But the sound of freedom, did you realise how big that was going to be? One of the biggest movies of 2023 and it beat some massive blockbuster films. Did you realise how big it would be? I was hoping it would be this big. You know, I, 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 the only reason I put money into the film and the only reason we, we bid it is to create a movement. You don't create a movement with, with a hundred people or even a thousand people watching it. And so I, I was, I'm super grateful that it has become what it is. It's a, it, it was, we beat out Mission Impossible day one and, and on, and uh, Indiana Jones, we beat those ones out. We only spent $14 million on the film. And it has done over $250 million in the box office sales. And now it's going online. It's going to be much, much bigger because, and here's what's beautiful. At least our money that's coming in from our, our, my investments and stuff are going right into the healing site. We're building healing retreats. We're, we're building out safe houses where the, the money that's coming in from it is creating more good. And, and I didn't, I didn't realize that it would be a global phenomenon but I'm super grateful that it is because you're right. It is creating an opportunity to have the conversations. Two years ago, in most households, it wasn't polite conversation over dinner to talk about child trafficking, right? 
But now that the movie was the number one independent film in the in the country and then in the world, it's just growing everywhere. Now, every single country that we go to, and I've been traveling for the last two and a half months, my wife and I, we've been in all over the globe. And every country we go into, we're meeting with, with influencers and world leaders and, and royalty and people who can really make an impact in their country. And we're saying, okay, now I have your attention. Let's talk about this. That's what the movie is all about. Now that I have your attention, now let's talk about this. What do we need to do to keep the kids safe? What policies do we need to change so these guys stay in jail for good? What do we need to do to heal people so that that trauma is never passed on to that next generation? What do we need to do, in your opinion, to help save kids and protect kids more? I think that the key word is healing, okay? And this is healing all the way through. You are healing the children that have been through it will ensure that they don't pass that, sh that, that trauma on when they're older. Healing the teenagers who were, were holding on to that trauma will, will, make, will save millions of children from being abused in the future. Healing the adults so that it's not just, just traffic children, it's abuse in, the own, in our own homes and neighborhoods, et cetera. And realize this, I'm not, I'm not saying... And this is important to know, most adults who dealt with childhood trauma, most adults don't pass it on. I'm not saying because you've dealt with that, you're going to become a pedophile, okay? Because most adults, almost all of us have dealt with something. But what it does do is that it, it comes out in some form of abuse, anger, management issues, a physical, emotional abuse type things, and in some cases, a sexual abuse of a child. So the only way that we're going to, to focus on liberating humanity, the only way that that's going to happen is for us to stand up and say, okay, what do I need to do? Look at the man in the mirror and say, what do I need to do to fix my stuff? How do I need to heal? And in fact, here's some amazing numbers. I come from the finance world, and one of my favorite things to do is look at, at, at compounding interest, right? How fast can you double your money if you keep the money that you earned going back into it, right? So let's play with compounding interest on the form of healing. If you, if, 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 or if your listeners, if they say, okay, I'm going to take a year, an entire year, and heal myself. People say, oh, I can't, I can't change the world, but I can heal myself. Let me show you how by healing yourself you can heal the world, right? You take a year and focus on healing yourself, getting the help that you need, going to, you know, getting the therapy that you need or going to a guided meditation, whatever you need to do to really work through that trauma. You heal yourself in a year. You take the next year and, and you mentor some other people. You still work your job, but you know, you, you're finding two people, two people that need to heal and tell them of your experience and help them to heal. That's one year. Now, now you're two years or you've only healed three people now, right? But the next year, let's say that those two people pass that on and they each help two people to heal. Now you're three years into it and you, you only have a handful of people that have healed. However, if that continues, those two people helping two people, those two people helping two people, et cetera, 33 years, you end up healing 8.5 billion people. 33 years, 8.5 billion people. We've literally healed the world by starting to heal yourself and then passing that on. So that's, that's how we fix this, is we, we work through our trauma, we focus on that healing, and, and, and then help others do the same. What do you think of Epstein Island now, that you've seen firsthand what it's like, kids getting so high-end high businessmen, these because of the connection with the list and Epstein's list and Glenn Maxwell and there was never any list exposed. Do you see? Because it, it, it sounds like the Epstein stuff, what you were saying at the start, it sounds exactly like yeah. what people's been saying. But see, even though you're going through all that as well, Paul, do you then become a target? Do you then feel f threatened for your own life? Of course. And safety? Because you're exposing the world's worst stuff. Of course. How it's, do you protect yourself? Do you feel spiritually connected or uh, protected or how does how do you both? You know, I I um I don't think it's any more dangerous going public 
than being face to face with guys selling me eight year olds. It would kill me in a second if they knew who I was. There's there's plenty of federal judges that have put really bad guys behind prison, behind bars that uh, that you know they they have to be watching. For me in this this work, it's it's a spiritual protection. I really believe that I'm doing God's work in fighting this evil. And in doing so, if I've got, I've got legions of angels that are protecting me and my family in this work. And there's a lot of good people. There's a lot of good people, even people that have made bad decisions or they're like, you know what? You're right. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help protect and, and the children I'm going to protect. I've got so many good people around me everywhere that are, that are creating that protection. But I will say this, this evil goes all the way to the top in many, many countries. Okay, all the way to the top. Why? Why do you think Jeffrey Epstein's list hasn't been brought out and all the details brought out? If if the people who are really controlling the narrative, that are really controlling, if you think that your people that you got into office are making all the decisions on their own heart, no, you know, there's there's a level of control all the way across the board. So, what will happen is this: if you if you want to control the votes of a senator of a congressman, of a judge, if you want to control their votes forever, get blackmail on them of this type, okay? If you have on film them with a 14-year-old at Jeffrey Epstein's Island, you can control their vote forever. And you don't want that information to come out. Why? Because we're going to vote them out of office and hopefully send them to jail. And then we vote in all new people. And then you've got to corrupt a whole bunch of new people and get dirt on them in order to control the narrative, to control the vote, to move things in the direction that you want them to happen. Okay? We're fighting evil on all levels. Big media, big Hollywood did not want our film to come out. Why? Because there's people involved in this all the way through. Now, I'm not saying that everybody and there's, I, I know a lot of good people in the government. I know a lot of good people in Hollywood. I know a lot of good people in big media, but a lot of them report to things higher than them that are being controlled. And, and there are some dark agendas and you have to ask yourself, what kind of agenda do they have? What kind of things are they force feeding our families? And why are they allowing crap? Like on Netflix, for example, you know, Netflix lets Let's a TV series called Cuties, a bunch of 10 year olds dressed up like strippers, but they don't want to have Sound of Freedom. Really? Why? We have to start asking as good men and women globally, we have to start asking these questions. Who's controlling the narrative? How are we in slavery? How are we in slavery to big media? How are we, how are we in slavery to Hollywood? How are we in slavery to big, big pharma? How are we in slavery to, to pornography? What are the things in our lives that, that we are not really in control of? And how can we release ourselves from that system of control so that we can live, truly live a life of abundance, a life of freedom? Where do you go forward for the future, Paul? I'm going to liberate humanity. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not their savior, right? They're their own. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show them the way. I'm going to show them the light. I'm going to show the, the rich guys that had everything like I did. Hey, there's a better way. You don't have to live your life all focused on greed and money and arrogance. You can use that to do massive good in the world. And I'm going to, I'm going to go all the way from there, all the way down to the guys that are in the prison system and say, guess what? You're loved. You've got light in you. Yeah, you fucked up. You did some bad stuff. You hurt people. And that's why you're separated from those people. But you can redeem yourself. I'm not going to fix you. I'm not going to save you. Nobody's going to save anybody else. But what we can do is we can recognize in ourselves that every one of us need to heal in some way. And, and in doing so, we can, we can transform our own lives and then be a mentor for other people to do the same. So, so that's why I chose the, the domain liberating humanity and, and the social media liberating humanity. That's what it's all about. We've got, to, we've got to figure out how to help humanity liberate themselves from all of this crap that's been holding us back. I believe most, most religions 
throughout all of history, most religions believe that the, the end times are close now, right? And after this time of trib tribulation, then we're going to have a thousand years of peace. I think they got that part right. I think we're that close. I think we're that close to living in that world of peace. But the only way that we're going to do it is by taking all of this this mass psychosis that has come to us from our parents, from our religions, from our media, from our everything that, that are telling us that we, that we are better than other people in some way, that are helping us live in this world of arrogance and separation and realize that indeed we are all one. We are all connected. Every single person on earth is and help humanity raise that level of consciousness, raise the vibration of humanity and, and earth itself to the point where we can live in that thousand years of peace, where we can. I don't think God's going to come back and snap his fingers and we're all going to be nice to each other. No, we have to start with ourselves. We have to change. We, we, we need to decide what that looks like so that we can not only eradicate child trafficking, but that we can heal humanity in the process. For anybody watching, Paul, or listening, you talk about this system that people's in. How can people break free from it and awaken from it and understand that you don't have to settle for the life that you're in? Yeah. <laughs> you got to start with questioning everything. Questioning the stuff that your parents taught you. If your parents taught you that another race of people are below you or a people who believe differently are less than you. If your parents taught you that, you need to break free of that and say, okay, is that true? Is that true? Do I feel a feeling of peace when I think about that thing that I was taught? Or do I feel a separation from people? Do I feel a division, right? You have to start questioning what's coming in on your media. Is this really in the best interest of my family? this movie, this agenda, whatever it is. You need to start questioning Big Pharma globally. You know, what kind of things am I addicted to in the opioid crisis, et cetera, that were put in place by design? My, my first company in my early 20s helped people overcome anxiety and depression through changing the way that they think. Their, their negative habit patterns of thought, of worry, what if thinking, and getting them off of all of these anti-anxiety and depression medications. There's so much crap in our life that we're tied to. Even the systems of control in terms of, of our, our, our food production. I would encourage people to return to, to Mother Earth to figure out how to garden. Do you realize that if the system shut off tomorrow, Okay, let's say something crazy happened where the, like in 1857, the, the sun released a coronal mass ejection and boom, it turned off. It killed all the electronics on earth. Boom. The grids all go down. Most people would starve. Why? Because we can't pump gas. Transportation would stop. Uh, communication would stop. All of these things would stop. We're, we're so stuck in this system of control everywhere that if we don't know how to separate ourselves from that, get to a place where we can connect with Mother Earth and heal from that standpoint, grow our own food, etc. I think that that's super important for people. But that's just one of the things. We've got to separate ourselves from all of our addictions, our addictions to money, our addictions to pornography, our addictions to, to, to alcohol. All of these addictions are a low vibration energy that are keeping us stuck from ascending, from, from getting to this place of true inner peace and thereby global peace. Last question, Paul, or just as a advice actually for any parent that's watching, because a lot of people will be frightened by this. So I know you talk about cuddling your kids and showing them love, but what could parents, what could they take on board, which is important? Because my daughters and eh, my daughters, they don't have sleepovers and they hate me for it, but I don't know who's, there's nothing to do with their, their friends' parents. It could be the brothers or the sisters or anybody, the cameras in the house. I'm just paranoid now because I, I've interviewed enough people to understand how much fuckery goes on in the world. But for anybody watching, what could they do more to protect their kids and make sure they're safe and understand there's so, if there's something not quite right, how do they ask their kids? Because, you know, yourself, people can close off, people can be threatened, but they don't want to say anything. So... What would you say just to kind of give people some advice? Absolutely. A really strong relationship with your children to the point where they can tell you, hey, this thing happened at school and whatever else. That's, that's number one. Now, 
being a helicopter mom, a helicopter dad isn't healthy either. You know, saying, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I walk him to school until they're 25 years old. No, you need to be able to figure out how to teach them self-esteem, teach them high confidence in themselves. And that will go a long, long ways. They need to know that, and, and teach them some skills. I, I, uh, we, we teach, taught our daughter Krav Maga. Now, if you don't know what that is, this is Israeli special forces, hand-to-hand combat training. It's the most lethal on earth. You know, and a lot of the moves are not legal in the, in the ring with regular martial arts. You know, our daughter can kick somebody on the balls so that it'll go all the way through their throat, right? I mean, hardcore. She can kick above my head. She is badass in every way. And so, so giving your kids high self-esteem, a, a relationship with God, and, and confidence, confidence from a physical standpoint is so important, so important. You know, if, if they don't know how to defend themselves, then every single second that they're away from you, you're thinking, oh, shoot, what, what if, what if, what if? We don't want to live life in fear. That's, that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to live in fear all the time. That's going to eat us alive. You, you, I have what I call a, a circle of control and a circle of influence. Right. So, so, and, and a circle of concern. Sorry. So, so this is important. I, I have a friend, uh, Covey, that wrote this in his book, but I, I take it to a whole new level. So, every one of us have this, this circle of, of influence or a circle of com- concern. These are, um, these are things that we can do something about, and our concern are things that we worry about. And if you have things that are in your circle of concern, but they're outside of your circle of influence, you have two choices to make. Either push it out of your circle of concern so you're not spending all this negative energy worrying about stuff, or simply increase your circle of influence. What that means is, if you're worried about your kids all the time, give them the tools to defend themselves. Give them the tools to to protect themselves in case that happens, and teach them so that when you're not there, you don't have to control them. Now, I will say this, when it comes to the internet, you need to lock that down, right? Right? Don't, that, don't, don't let them post all the time as to where they're at and where they're traveling to and whatever else. These traffickers, these predators, they use the internet all the time to identify children that are vulnerable in some way. So, so make sure that, yeah, they can have friends, but nobody outside their friends can even search for them, right? Make sure that that's a closed loop system for your children if they do have a social media presence at all. In fact, a lot of operators I work with, they don't let their kids have any social media because they've seen it so much with these predators trying to identify who's vulnerable as children. Mm-hmm. Paul, would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? I'll say this. I'll say this. I've seen the darkest part of humanity. I have, I've been in the pit of hell. I've seen so much light and so much beauty when it comes to the rescue and rehabilitation and reuniting of children with their families. I believe in humanity. I'll say that. It's really easy to be in a position like I've been to lose hope, to lose hope in humanity as a whole. Thinking, what the, really? People are sowing hymens on, people are destroying children's lives. People are, what is, what is going, and it's really easy to lose hope. I have hope. I really do. I think that there's enough good men and women on this planet today. There's enough good men and women with good hearts to win this war, to win this war against darkness. They've got to start by winning the war within themselves. to to obliterate that darkness, to love themselves, heal themselves, work through their own issues. And then together, we can truly liberate humanity. I believe that. Paul, doing God's work. I wish you nothing but the best for the future, brother. And listen, what you do is is nothing short of remarkable. You're a true hero, mate, saving kids. And honestly, it's the what you have to put yourself through mentally, spiritually, physically to do what you've done over the last 10 years. There's, uh, there's nothing but pff, honestly, honestly struggling for words to actually put in the effort that people need to understand what some of these guys do, not just yourself, but there's some uh, amazing heroes all around this world to do this. That jaws, but listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been dark, but I'm sure a lot of people will get some guidance from it, and hopefully, you can keep doing what you're doing and and take it to to new heights, brother. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.